Well, thank you for coming. This is our first anniversary in this new space. Um, it's hard to believe we've been in here for a year already, but um, I am delighted that uh, you're here for this exhibition. Normally I have a podium, so I feel a little on display and a little naked, but um, <laughs> you know, I usually hide this and you know, but here we are. Um, my name is Mike Ensdorf. I'm the director of the Gage Gallery. I also teach photography here at Roosevelt University in the Department of Communication in Journalism and Media Studies. Um, and I am just delighted to have Greg Constantine back, uh, I want to say back home, right? Back uh, at the Gage Gallery. We had Greg at the original Gage Gallery down at the 18 South Michigan building uh, about three years ago. And I think, Greg, you were the official last exhibition in the old space. Um, so it's great to have you back here in the new space. Um, I want to thank a few people before I introduce Greg. Um, first and foremost, Susan O'Brien. Susan O'Brien uh, is visiting assistant professor of opera studies here at Roosevelt. Um, Susan and I collaborated on this exhibition. Um, over the summer, I was wondering how to have the the voices that are embedded in um, this publication, thank you, Kathy, um, kind of speak and, and have a presence in the space. Um, they were playing as you were all milling around, but um, normally people who come into a gallery are in a quieter space and are you know, not in a group of 50 having drinks and uh, talking with people. Um, so I encourage you to come back to the gallery uh, when you can uh, to hear the voices of uh, Susan O'Brien's um, students who are in her junior senior opera project uh, class. And uh, I think I said that Susan is a visiting assistant professor of opera studies. Um, and I'm really appreciative of their empathetic uh, readings of the stories that Greg collected uh, from detainees and others who um, have been affected, who are affected by their experiences in the uh, immigration detention centers in the US. And Greg, I'm sure we'll talk more about um, gathering those, those interviews and those voices. Um, also would like to thank um, Billy Monk. Oh, by the way, so, uh, uh, a handful of those students, probably half the class is here. So thank you to all of you. I'm sorry I'm not naming you individually, but you know uh, I'm grateful. And it was really a pleasure working with you on this project. Um, also, thanks to Billy Montgomery. Billy is uh, our instructor of journalism in the Department of Communication. And um, Tim DeRochers as well, who's the director of instructional technology. Uh, they both helped in recorder, recording and mastering the readings um, that, will, that are playing in the gallery, that will be playing in the gallery. Um, also, a big thank you to Amanda De Palma, uh, who has, where's Amanda? There's Amanda. Um, we've worked together on many exhibitions over the years, and um, it's always a pleasure working with you. Amanda's the uh, director of creative services here, and we collaborate on how the exhibition looks. Um, so I couldn't really do this without you, so thank you. Um, and Assistant Dean Julie Rowan, who um, continues to um, spread the word and do great work um, you know, for our College of Arts and Sciences and in help, helping to promote all of the events that we do in the college, um, especially here at the Gage Gallery. So thank you, Julie, as always. Um, and finally, uh, thank you to Greg. Um, for once again trusting us with your work. Um, and it's always a pleasure to work with Greg. Uh, Greg is an independent documentary photographer and author who has dedicated his career to stories and projects that focus on human rights, inequality, identity, and the power of the state. He spent 11 years working that's 11 years working on the acclaimed project Nowhere People from 2006 to 2016. That's the exhibition that we had at the Gage Gallery three years ago, uh, which was a global exploration documenting the lives and struggles of stateless individuals and ethnic communities around the world who had had their citizenship denied or stripped from them by governments, mostly because of discrimination and intolerance. Constantine, or I like to say Greg, <laughs> 
has spent the past two and a half years working in Malaysia, Mexico, the United Kingdom, and the United States on his most re recent project, Seven Doors. He is the author of three books, including Kenya's Nubians, Then and Now, published in 2011, Exiled to Nowhere, Burma's Rohingya in 2012, which was named the 2012 Notable Photo Book of the Year by Photo District News Magazine, a high honor. Uh, in, in the world of photography, I can tell you that for sure. And The Independent on Sunday in the UK. And also the book Nowhere People in 2015, which was recognized as one of the top 10 photo books of 2015 by Mother Jones Magazine in the US. I might add, we have five copies left of um, Nowhere People um, that, and I have a Sharpie in my pocket too. And so um, they're available for sale. Uh, just find me or find uh, Charlie. Charlie, where's your, raise your hand. There's Charlie back there, or Courtney. Um, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, sell you a copy of that. And Greg, I'm sure, would be happy to sign it. Um, exhibitions of his work have been shown in over 40 cities uh, worldwide, and his work has been widely published. In late 2016, he earned his PhD from Middlesex University in the UK. He has been a distinguished visiting fellow with the International State Crime Initiative at Queen Mary University of London, and in 2018 was named an Independent Scholars Research Fellow by the Independent Social Research Foundation in the UK. Spending a lot of time in England, huh? His most recent print initiative, Seven Doors Journal, which m most of you should have. If you don't have a copy, please, again, either see Courtney or Charlie or myself. Um, everyone, I want everyone to have a copy of that this evening. Um, has been distributed to local, national, and global org organizations in over 10 countries, and I'm sure Greg will talk a little bit more about how he gets those out there and who sees it and why. So, so thank you again for being here. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Constantine. Thanks, man. Right, man. Appreciate it, right. thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, really appreciate it. Um, there's a, a, a few people that I want to thank first um, and foremost is Mike. Um, thank you so much for believing in the work, for seeing the value of it, for allowing me to have the privilege of being part of the Gage family, uh, Gage Gallery family, um, and having my name associated with so many really uh, amazing photographers who I admire, um, who have also shown work in the old gallery and here at the new gallery. Um, like I said a couple of years ago, I really do believe that Gage Gallery and what you have created over all these years has established this beacon of light and hope for documentary photography in the Midwest. And um, I just can't thank you enough for treating the work and showing it and, and everything um, the way that you have. So thank you very much, Mike. Um, that also extends to Roosevelt University. Um, it's always great to collaborate with the university and have the work shown here and engage your students and also see how you as a university reaches out to other communities here in the Chicago area and encourages youth to come in and be exposed to subject matter um, like this as well. So thank you very much. I would also like to thank Courtney and Charlie. Um, thank you very much for everything you've done. Um, Charlie, thank you so much for taking such great care in making sure that this exhibition has been hung the way that it has, um, and the thought that go, has gone behind the sequencing of these images, which we talked about a lot yesterday, and that was a really amazing thing to hear you talk about how you envisioned things to be laid out on the walls here, so thank you very much. And also to Amanda for also contributing your vision to how this exhibition could be treated in this space. Um, so those are just all the thank yous I want to get out of the way. There's more I want to thank later on. Um, but just to give you a little history about uh, myself and this particular project, 
Um, I started this project in early 2017. It was a transition from the project Nowhere People. Um, at the very end of that project, I was meeting with stateless people in Europe who um, had been in and out of immigration detention dozens of times. I thought I had heard all the stories of stateless people around the world, but the stories of that impact that immigration detention had on somebody in the UK or in Italy or in Serbia was unlike any story I'd ever heard before. Before. And automatically, I knew that that, would go, that was going to be the next project I was going to sink my teeth into. Um, I had no idea what to expect, what was to come, um, but that's one of the exciting parts of being a documentary photographer is that element of discovery along the way and allowing things to organically present themselves. Um, the project was started in Malaysia with several, about three, work, three months worth of work in Malaysia, which you'll see in some of the issues of uh, issue number one of the Seven Doors Journal. Um, some work was done in the UK, and then Trump got elected. And I knew that at that moment in time that it would be, this was going to be the time to be coming back home to the United States after having lived abroad for 13 years and to really dive into a project that I felt would be really important and make some kind of, hopefully, some significant contribution to what was going to be happening and was look like it was going to be happening in the country. Um, whatever your political leanings might be, um, the fact is, is that the media has covered this story quite extensively, immigration and immigration detention. but. As a photographer, I also felt like there were significant gaps in the way that the media was covering this story. And as somebody who doesn't do assignment work, I exist off of grants and funding that I have that has liberated me from the whole entire editorial process, allowing me to kind of work at my own pace, um, dive into issues that I'm personally passionate about, and find creative ways to disseminate that work um, I saw immigration detention in the United States as being this great opportunity to try to contribute something new. Um, this particular series of 12 images, I believe it is, is our 12, 10 images, are 10 images of a series of about 35 of panoramics of m these massive immigration detention centers all across the country. This is the first time they've ever been exhibited. They have never been published because I have found no publisher willing to publish them. Um, and there, it's actually the first of three parts to the work that has been, that been working on here in the United States over the past two years. The second installment will be published the beginning of, or the, the spring of next year, and the third part in sometimes towards the end of summer, hopefully right before election time. Um, <clears throat> the rationale behind working on this particular story and particularly shooting panoramics and the way that they've been treated and, 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 and photographed is most of the times when we look at how the architecture of this mammoth immigration detention system in the United States has been visually translated is through infographics or a map with dots. <coughs> nothing has been done, nothing has been done, oh, I got a Coke right here, nothing has been done to try to visually translate that extensive architecture of the immigration detention system through photographs. And that's what I've tried to do is I've tried to create a series of pictures that actually provides a visual photographic reference point for people to see where these places actually are, <coughs> what they look like, and also the menacing, ominous, sinister sense of mood that basically permeates all around them. <coughs> Pardon me. I'll say that this project in working in the United States it's also been a collaborative process. Pardon me, I'm really sorry. <coughs> it's been a collaborative process. Um, in the past, my partner and I have always traveled in different trajectories. But working in the United States has been a collaborative process in the sense that together we've traveled over 20,000 miles in our car, crisscrossing the United States, looking at places and meeting with people that have largely been 
constructed intentionally out of sight or people who have, for the most part, been completely and totally let down by this country and are now invisible to a degree as well. <coughs> it's been a passion project from both of us. Um, it has been... <laughs> We've got everything here at the gate. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. I'm okay. It has been a, a passion project having <coughs> worked and lived abroad for so many years and coming back to this country with kind of fresh eyes and seeing the tone and the mood and the policies that have been permeating across the country over the past two years. And again, whatever your political leanings are, that's fine. I'm not here to make a political statement. But what is true is that people come to this country seeking safety and sanctuary. And they still see the United States as this beacon of hope. But when they come here, they're most people when you talk with people who have been in detention, they will not describe approaching the US border and surrendering themselves. They'll never use the word surrender. They'll always use the word present. And when you say, why don't you use the word surrender? They say, because surrender implies that I've done something wrong. Present means I'm formally presenting myself as a human being to the state of the United States and asking for safety and sanctuary. And that's a, very, that's a very big difference. And the nomenclature that's used to describe these kind of issues in the media is something that we, I think we feel we, we need to rigorously really look at. And what I hope with this project and these, 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 these pictures is that they allow you to see a couple different things. <coughs> Most of these pictures I've never seen printed, ever. <clears throat> they were all shot on film, huge, big negatives that were scanned. And when I presented all this and Mike approached me, he said, the first thing he said was, Greg, I want to print these things really big. And I was like, let's do it. Let's go for it. But walking in here yesterday and standing in front of a picture taken in Taylor, Texas, of the T. Don Hutto facility, which is a women's facility just outside, about 40 minutes outside of Austin, Texas. <coughs> and standing in front of that print, I told Mike and Charlie yesterday that the proportionality of the print actually places me right at the moment when I click the shutter on that Fuji 617 camera, panoramic camera. That the feeling that I got of the absence of a bunch of teenagers playing baseball on a field knowing that just across the fence on every day would be dozens of women in prison uniforms, most of them who have done absolutely nothing wrong other than come to the country, that juxtaposition really, that ominous sense really sticks with me when I look at the photographs when they're printed this big. And so what I wanted to try to do was to do a couple things with these images. It's not traditional photojournalism, reportage. It's not art photography either. <clears throat> it's documenting. And what I wanted to try to do with these photographs was to create a sense of place. These facilities are built intentionally and strategically in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Or, as I've described it, they're buried in nothingness. They're buried in the nothingness of a desert. They're buried in the nothingness of a farm farmlands, or even with the Tacoma, Washington facility, <coughs> it's buried in the middle of an industrial area, right in the middle of the heart of the city, where people can't see them, where it makes it impossible or so challenging for loved ones to go and visit someone who's in detention, for the legal community to actually have access to them to provide legal assistance, which it's already, it's been, it's been proven that just simply the access to a lawyer increases your chances of having a positive uh, a result in your asylum case is raised exponentially. <clears throat> so in a way, the isolation and the desolation of the physicality of where these places are created and placed strategically in a way mirrors the desolate, isolated feeling of the people who are in them themselves. And that I wanted to try to do. That then presented another challenge. 
I'll never be able to get inside one of these places with my camera freely. And if I ever was, I would be so monitored and regulated. And to be honest with you, I feel that the pictures that I would be creating are pictures that have already been taken. They're pictures that people have already seen. They're pictures of people being held administratively in detention centers with uniforms on that automatically associate them with a level of criminality that they do not deserve. So it's actually feeding into prejudices and stereotypes that have already been created, which I don't want to do with this work. But how do you humanize a place like this? So the next task was trying to meet with and interview as many people as I could whose lives were affected by immigration detention and the experience in one of these places. So it was then a series of networking with all sorts of different people, legal associations, visitation services, um, activists, um, just well-wishers, people who had been in one of these places, whether they were a detainee, they were somebody who had been released, or somebody who went and visited these people, getting access to them, and interviewing them, and hearing their conversation, and having a conversation with them, and listening to them talk about how that experience has impacted them as a human being. How does it impact a person who's a volunteer, who's retired, who volunteers their time to travel 40 miles to go inside of the Otero detention facility in New Mexico and just meet and show some kind of human contact with somebody who's been in detention for six months. That person is not a detainee, but that person actually, by engaging with that person in detention, detention has affected their lives and how they see the policies in the world around them. So their, their, their point of view is valid. So it was then six to eight months of contacting people and interviewing people. Some of them were done through WhatsApp calls of somebody in Cameroon who had just been detained and uh, deported, or Nigeria, and then collecting their voices and their stories to add some kind of level of humanity to these places. Like I said, this has been a collaborative process. I've worked with my fiance, Jennifer, for the past two years. We've traveled to every single corner of the country that we feel like together. And the deep, deep, deep research of being able to find out how this continually moving monster of immigration detention in the United States is happening and where to go and something happening here and we might want to talk with somebody there has come from this collaborative of working with her on this project. So this exhibition is a testament of both of our work, and I'm really proud of that. So thank you. What will come next as a part of this project is kind of exciting, in a sense. Because it's been almost impossible to find, or it has been impossible to find, somebody to publish the work. With the grants that I have, I'm able to independently publish um, the Seven Doors Journal. Nowhere People was a photography project that turned into a publishing project. Seven Doors is a photography project that at the outset is a publishing project to where the work that's being done is not going to be collated for 11 years and then released. It's actually release it now when people need to know about it. So we print 1,000 copies of each one of these little 20 to 24 page journals that are very image heavy and voice heavy and everything. And what happens with the thousand copies of each issue that we publish? Well, for this particular issue, about 700 copies have already gone out the door at no cost. They've been sent to major organizations who are working on immigration detention across the United States, to small grassroots organizations working locally, whether they're in Yakima, Washington, or in Wichita, or in Tucson, or in Columbus, Ohio. They've been sent to lawyers across the country. They've been sent to academics across the country and activists, all so that everybody has some kind of visual ammunition and tool to be able to use to show people what this issue is all about and what they're advocating for and what kind of change they're looking for. Most of these organizations will never have a budget to be able to commission a photographer to work two or three weeks to try to create a story for them. 
So for me, it's always about trying to see how far the work can go and how creative I can be in getting the work out there. And Seven Doors Journal is something that I'm incredibly proud of because I feel like it's doing just that. The next, issue, the next issue will come out towards the end of this year, and it'll be about the work done in Mexico. There's immigration detention happening in Mexico at a huge rate as well, not just here in the United States, but it's also about what's happening in Mexico. The next issue, issue number four, will be part two of the United States. Issue number five will be the work that I'll be concluding in the, Uni in the United Kingdom. Issue number six will be the third part of the United States work, and the final one will be work of done in immigration detention in Europe. Um, I just want to say that I'm incredibly proud of this work, incredibly proud to be a part and have it shown here at the Gage Gallery. I just want to say that there's one little piece of information that I think is really interesting that all of us should know about, and that's supporting some of the st statistics on the wall over here, is that we all know that immigration detention is a multi-billion dollar business here in the United States. The, these are not federally built detention facilities. They're actually run, owned, and operated by private corporations that are profiting off of US policy. And the Department of Homeland Security is actually subsidizing these. And how are they subsidizing them? For a facility like Tacoma, Washington, that basically has about 1,000 beds, it has a guaranteed bed minimum that DHS pays it, whether the beds are full or not. But there are alternatives which people need to know about. And those alternatives make a significant difference. And I'll tell you why, how it is a significant difference. Department of Homeland Security estimates that it costs $133 per day to hold one adult in immigration detention per day. It costs $319 per day to detain a family in detention in the United States. There are proven to be alternative de to detention program programs across the United States that actually cost $5 per day for somebody and treats them in a humane way where they're not behind, locked behind bars, they're not isolated and segregated from their families in a wider community, they have access to, to legal assistance, and they actually feel like a human being. What is logical? Um, so I just want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, um, but I hope that you can share this exhibition. It'll be up until December 12th, I believe. Um, and again, just really thank you very much for coming out tonight. I want to thank my family for being here. It means so much that all of you are here tonight to support the work that I've been doing, the work that we've been doing, and to see this. Um, and again, thank you all for coming here. And Mike, you're the man. Thank you. It's so great. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for a minute or two, or? Yeah. So were these images taken on public property? Yeah. So the question was, were these images taken on public property? Before I started shooting these photographs, I talked with a lawyer at the National Press Photographers Association <laughs> to see where my legal boundaries were in terms of how far could I push things. Everything is taken on public property. Um, and if it's not taken on public property, if it's on private property, I've gotten permission from the landowners to be able to be there. Um, so all of these photographs would either be on a street, on a sidewalk. Um, uh, the one in the retirement mobile home park, uh, public, private, not really quite sure. I had to talk my way through the... <laughs> I actually had to tell the, the guards at that facility that I was looking for a house for my mother, <laughs> which they would leave, let me in. But so the, take, for example, the photograph taken of, the, of Tacoma, Washington. That photograph is actually taken on the interstate in an overpass on the interstate over it. Um, so, you know, I've tried to be as calculating and responsible as I can in terms of where I'm taking the photographs. And, but that's still, that has led to harassment, to sheriffs being called on me, police being called on me by security personnel of a lot of, of some of the facilities. Yeah. So a geeky question, can 
you tell us about the camera that you use? Um, yeah, so the camera that I use is, it's really interesting because up until two years ago, I only shot film. So I shot on a Leica M6, an F100, I used Tri-X, I mean, that's how, that's how I worked. But then I shift over to digital when I started this project. Um, but I knew that I still wanted to experience the discipline of film. Um, and I soon found out that I realized that I wanted to shoot panoramics. And uh, I didn't know what camera to use. I was thinking, well, a Hasselblad X-Pan, really expensive, outside of my budget. Um, there were a couple other ones. But uh, a friend, a, a retired photographer that we know, we live part of the year on Salt Spring Island in British Columbia, um, he said, you know, I have this Fuji GX617, and it's a workhorse. And he goes, you might want to try it out. So I tried it out. I shot some pictures on Salt Spring with it. I fell absolutely in love with it. And he said, it's gathering dust. Just use it, because I know it'll be going to good use. So I used it for almost a year, until I finally felt so guilty for using it for so long that I ended up buying it from him. So it's a really big camera that takes medium format, 120 uh, roll film. It shoots four negatives per strip. Um, and it's really difficult film to process uh, because the agitation, you can get air bubbles. So I send it to a lab that does nitrogen drip processing in California. And then everything is scanned on either an Epson scanner or at latitude here in Chicago on a Kodak Crea scanner. Um, and it's a really just a beautiful camera to use. It, the discipline and having to shoot it and metering and horizons, it forces you to slow down. And that's the magic of film. One of the magics of film is that it forces you to slow down and, and use your intelligence to calculate the way that you might be able to take a picture. So I've loved shooting with that camera. And, um, and I've been shooting. The third part of this project is that most of these massive immigration detention centers are located on the west coast or along the southern border. There's one in Ohio, there's one in Denver, there's one in Elizabeth and in Farmville, Virginia, but in the middle of the country, what is that apparatus that ICE is using to actually detain people? Well, that is county jails. And so as part of this project this year and last year, we've done two extensive road trips all the way across the center of the United States, meeting with people, but also creating a similar series of pictures like this, but all of county jails across the US that have contracts with ICE and are holding people for charges. And I'm using a six by six Mamiya, so square frame medium format to create all of those images. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in most of these, these are all adults, for the exception of Carnes, which is now a family facility. Um, and I believe there were some in Hutto for a while, um, but most of them are, are adult only. The child facilities, um, the panoramics that I have of those, they're not included in this exhibition. So Tornillo, Tent, camp that was put up last year and then dismantled at the beginning of uh, this year. Um, and then there's a lot of more kind of indescript facilities that are being, where um, uh, minors are being held, whether it's in an old hotel somewhere in San Antonio or a, a little building in the middle of downtown El Paso. <coughs> so most of these are adult facilities. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, I think that's a great question. The question is, you know, when you think about the internment camps that were here in the country back in the 1940s during World War II, um, <clears throat> where do I see all of this in the political landscape of the US moving forward? And is there any glimpse of a political will for changing this? <clears throat> I think it's a great question. I'm not particularly an optimist when it comes to these type of things. Um, I do feel like the machinery of capitalism is something that, is really hard to stop. And the, the, the results of just the DNA 
of our market economy and the way that we go is going to support, can, can, you, can you just support these things? Because the lobby of the companies that do this are incredibly powerful. And you know, the reality of it is, is that when you really think about it, the amount of people and organizations and businesses, whether they're big or small, <clears throat> that are actually sustaining themselves from the money that is being earned and filtered into not just the detention system, but the full entire immigration system in the United States is so huge that how would you dismantle something like this? So it's kind of like one little piece at a time. So like take for example, Adelanto facility right here in California. This is the first photograph that you walk past. Just about a month ago, the state of California actually put in laws that would then dismantle the use of private prison companies for immigration detention in California. And that came from grassroots activists, from grassroots communities really seeing that it, how the disgust in it and voicing their opinion, and just the process. And that, to me, is a little bit of a beacon of hope. But I also feel like the, the climate that we're in politically here in the country and the divisiveness between the others and who belongs and that definition, um, it's quite venomous right now. So I feel like these places are still gonna exist for quite some time. And to be honest with you, I also have to put in some context. This has been happening, Reagan, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump. This is not just something that is totally isolated to Donald Trump in the past couple of years. But the acceleration of the use of these facilities has been exponential over the past three years. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but we all know how complicated uh, and childish US politics can be sometimes and actually making decisions and things that are meaningful happen. Um, but I do feel like this is all a part of something that will take a long time to dismantle. Yeah, the questions about the alternatives to detention, these $5 as a day kind of programs, <clears throat> it's a great question. A lot of these are done that are actually well established and it's, a lot of them are through case management. So a lot of them would be somebody comes to the United States, is seeking asylum, and what you also have to understand is most people who are being held in these, they've never done anything wrong. They're being held administratively. So meaning that as their asylum process is going forward, they're being held in one of these facilities. So instead of being held in one of these facilities, there are programs out there that actually helps to track and manage people through that particular, their course, the course of action of their asylum claim, the legal part, to make sure that they actually show up to to a court hearing on time, that their paperwork is all done, that they have a safe place to live, et cetera, et cetera probably demands more personal kind of touch and management, but the fact is is that it's such a more humane way of treating people. And when you do really think about it, the fact is, is that all these, the people who come here to claim asylum, they, if they do claim asylum, they will, more than likely, they will end up becoming a US citizen, part and parcel of the country. And, isn't that the way that we would want somebody who actually, in their trajectory, to feel like they're a citizen to contribute, rather than having them start that pathway through being in one of these places for a year and feeling like they've been completely and totally let down and betrayed by the system that they have placed at such high hopes? Um, I would think that the alternatives would make much more sense, not just economically, but also just through, you know, human dignity. I mean, you know, really. So, yeah. Um, what's the reason for the title Seven Doors? Uh, okay, great question. So what is the reason for the title Seven Doors? <clears throat> um, just like the Nowhere People Project started this project with no title. Um, and a lot of that just comes just organically. And I knew that when we started the project, one of the major objectives would be to create work and challenge people to think, to broaden their definition of what detention is. 
that detention is not just being inside of one of these facilities. That detention is actually something that extends itself to a family member who has someone in detention and the trauma that that causes them. That it's the trauma that a pro bono lawyer feels by trying to constantly have to battle and navigate this Kafka-esque legal system in a way that you end up finding you just completely run around in circles. So for me, detention is just beyond those walls of that center. So I was in the UK, and I was interviewing a man in Manchester. We were in a public park. We were sitting and we were talking for like an hour and a half. Such an amazing guy. And he's from West Africa. And at the very end of our conversation, he said, um, when I went into immigration detention, I remember having to walk through only one door. And then I was in this detention center for three and a half years. He was detained for three and a half years. And he said, and after those three and a half years, when they let me out, he said, I remember counting having to walk through seven different metal doors from my cell all the way to the door where they basically said, okay, now you're free. And he turned to me and he said, how can I be free when I've gone through this for three and a half years? I will always feel like I'm in detention. And that to me was, that's exactly the, the heart of what this project is trying to do. Hence the reason for calling the project Seven Doors. Yes? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think this is one of, the, one of the other reasons why I love working on big global projects like Nowhere People. Nowhere People was 18 different countries over the course of 11 years. Uh, Seven Doors right now is a couple different countries, Malaysia, the UK, uh, and the United States. And one of the big things that I really love about working on these projects is that at the end of the day, you can present material that will allow people to compare and contrast how different policies change from one place to the next, and, and hopefully try to not provide answers, um, but allow people to ask questions about the very question that you just asked. If I look at the stories of people who have experienced immigration detention in Malaysia, let's say, the work in Malaysia very much focused on the experience of a variety of different Burmese ethnic communities that had escaped and left Burma because of human rights abuse or war and were seeking asylum in Malaysia. And their experience in Malaysia was as if they were constantly being hunted by the authorities. That was something that came up. And there's indefinite detention there. So you would meet with somebody and they would have absolutely no idea how long it would be for their family member to get out. Um, so in Malaysia, you would constantly walk through some of the most touristed areas in downtown Kuala Lumpur and at 11 o'clock at night when the street is packed with tourists eating on the sidewalks and in sidewalk restaurants, a truck will pull up in the middle, that's immigration, and people will get out and they'll literally, literally start arresting chefs and cooks and walking them through all the tourists and putting them in a paddy wagon and taking them to a detention center. It's very, very visible in that sense. But here in the United States, and I would say in extension also the United Kingdom, there's this, in the stories that people have shared, there is this level of betrayal that is unlike any I've ever heard before. And out of that story of betrayal, then oozes out the intentionality of how sinister in the, the process actually is. And that's what's different about the stories here in the United States. Um, I don't know if that totally answers, that's just one element of the stories that are different between other countries and, and here. And, and to be honest with you, it's also a degree of people here in immigration detention feeling like the entire system is totally set up to either do one of two things, to either grind someone down to such a point that they don't want to go any further and they choose to self-deport, attrition, or 
to basically push them through this unknown Kafkaesque legal system to the point to where the next thing they do is they find they're back at home in hiding and have been put on a plane somewhere. That, I mean, really, that's, those are a lot of the stories. And it varies from, you know, from men to women and everything. But I'd say just in an essence, those are some of the differences. Um, what led me to shoot pictures in panoramic? Um, one was I wanted to continue to shoot film. And I was really, I just, I wanted to continue to stay in that discipline. Um, two was I just felt that panoramics translated this scene so much better than a 35 millimeter frame. Um, the vastness, the landscape, the, you know, the, just the totality of these places and where they're constructed and how big they are and how they just can also be these small, tiny little specks in the landscape of nothingness. I mean, that in itself was, you can only do, I feel like you can only accomplish that through, through panoramics in a sense. I mean, there's one photograph here. I mean, I think probably the closest one that gets to that point would be the one of Carnes in Carnes, Texas. But there's one in San Luis, uh, Arizona, that's a detention center that literally, I mean, like, it just looks like this tiny little piece of the landscape. But here it is, this awful place. So that was the motivation. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, did I ever interview or did we ever interview any of the staff or guards at any of these facilities? I really wish we could have. Um, we didn't. Uh, but I will share a small little anecdote, and that was in San Diego, while we're working down in San Diego, uh, myself, Jen, and uh, uh, a woman who works for uh, one of the organizations, an activist organization in California, were sitting there having coffee at a Starbucks, because it was the first time I've ever met her face to face. And we were sitting there having coffee outside at a Starbucks, and we were talking all about immigration detention. And a guy sat down next to us with his kids, and kind of, you know, a rugged looking guy, and in the middle of our conversation, he interrupted us. And he said, all of you, everything you're talking about is totally wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I worked in one of those facilities for several years, and they're all criminals. And it, there was, again, you felt like there was no point for any kind of discussion. It was always going to lead into an argument. Um, but it was so amazing to hear just through what he could hear in his ear us talking about to elicit that kind of response. So, <clears throat> anyways, just, I think we're finished, but I just want to say thank you again for coming out, and, uh, and thank you again, Mike, and, and everybody here at Gage Gallery in Roosevelt. Yeah, thanks, Thanks, guys. I really appreciate right, it. Okay. Thanks, guys.